Knowledge is power, and this is Powerful Stuff. Wellness Education Cannabis Advocates of Nevada present the Weekend 702 Nevada Cannabis News Hour with your host, Jen Solis. For the next 60 minutes, we'll take an in-depth look at the cannabis reform revolution sweeping the nation. The phone lines are open at 731-1230. That's 731-1230 or toll-free. Toll-free. 1-866-820-5528. That's 1-866-820-KLAV. Now, let's bring on the host. Here is Jen Summers. Hi, welcome to the show, everybody. And for the next 60 minutes, we'll be talking about cannabis in the local region and regional news and the nationwide. Uh, we'll also talk about cannabis worldwide and with a variety of different topics. Starting the hour, we'll talk about local news here. Well, the big rush is over. Everybody that is applying for a cannabis dispensary, a grow, a production in the state of Nevada has had uh, the the deadline is over. The deadline was over at 5 p.m. yesterday. If you did not have your um, if you didn't have your boxes postmarked by 5 p.m. as of yesterday, and that's only postmarked with the United States Post Office, then you are out of the picture. Um, a, a lot of confusion happened around that because there were a lot of rumors that said, it. well, no, it has to be up there by that date. Yeah, there were, there were a lot of applicants that actually got on planes and flow, flew up there to turn in their application by 5 o'clock. That's crazy. That's crazy. And they sent out a, the state sent out a reminder that said, hey, if you're going to send it by United States Postal Service, if you have it postmarked by the 18th at 5 p.m., we will accept it. But if you want to have it delivered by, you know, FedEx or DHL or one of those, then it has to be up here at 5 p.m. Monday. Um, so I think there was, that's probably where the confusion came in is if you're using a delivery service versus the United States Postal Service. That's correct. That's correct. And you know what, man? You know how people in the rumor mill are. We were calling people to get uh, surveys for North Las Vegas and some other type of, you know, finalized stuff done. And we had bureau, uh, bureau, uh, bureaucrats telling us, oh, well, if you haven't already mailed that, then you guys are out of the picture. I'm like, yeah, who are you? They're obviously not the state, you know. And it's like zoning and planning for you know somebody else. And a lot of the municipalities, they went against the state's wishes, you know. So, yeah, we have we have a little bit to discuss on that one coming up. But um, as of what two forty five two fifty seven today, the total count was four hundred thirty seven applications. That's all inclusive: the dispensaries, cultivation. Uh, testing facilities and production and uh, I was at a meeting today and uh, they're they're saying the state is expecting over the next uh, by Friday with all the postmark things at least another 130 applications to be coming in so we're talking close to 600 for the state of Nevada and that's pretty good I mean as long as a lot of them are in cultivation a lot of people will get um, you know good news and don't forget, each applicant had to pay a non-refundable five thousand dollar fee per application, and then once they're approved, what they got to pay an additional thirty thousand, I believe it an is, an additional thirty thousand dispensary, and that's on dispensary owners. Okay, and then there was an additional what, like fifteen thousand for cultivation, and and uh, lesser amounts anyway for for the lesser parts of the application. You know, and I, I've been talking to a lot of people and and a lot of people that have money don't know a lot about cannabis and a lot of people that know about cannabis don't have a lot of money. But so those that think, have money are going out of state to get everybody instead of coming into our backyard here. Exactly, and that's just crazy. Um, well, I, I was talking to an investor and, and I was talking to them about, they said, well, you know, there's not much call for, you know, brownies and edibles and stuff like that on production. And I looked at him and I said, you're out of your mind. And, and, he's, and he looked back at me kind of shocked. And I said, I said, don't you understand all like the oils, the waxes, the butters, the cannabis, you know, the pills, the RSO, all of this stuff is huge, huge 
huge business. I said, they even have a 710 cup. And he looked at me and he goes, what's that? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. He sounded almost like him. he said, what's that? And I said, 710 is oil upside down. And he looked at me and goes, oh. And I now said, I you mean it. you've been hanging out with all these people schmoozing and acting like you're part of our crowd? And, you and, know. and that's the frustrating part is you have all these bureaucrats, all these well-off investors, people that have no clue what all-encompassing the cannabis industry is. When you talk about cannabis, medical marijuana, people automatically think, oh, you're going to smoke it. That is not the only way to consume your medication. Absolutely not. I was reading some research this uh, these last couple of weeks, and in Colorado, 40% of the market is edibles, waxes, and stuff that's manufactured, not just the flour. So almost half of your business is the you know the bottom half and the trim of the plant being turned into other things it's it's not all about the butter the flour and that's the thing a lot of these bureaucrats as they were making their regulations and everything they couldn't comprehend the uses of so much product to make the oils and butters and everything else you know it's frustrating you know with the closed-mindedness you still have on this issue yet if you have a prescription pill everybody's like oh okay yeah that's no that's no problem well kurt you know kurt stopped baking the cookies that were so good because i was gaining weight and he and he instead it was using cannabis infused um or coconut oil capsules you know he was just putting it into little capsules of coconut oil for me so that i don't gain weight uh hint hint um, anyway, so well, and we're also finding that a lot of patients are turning to that because to, it, it basically is cannabis in a pill and all of us since we were young have been taking pills. So a lot of the older generation, you give them a cannabis pill, they don't think of it like, hey, I'm smoking cannabis to get high. It's just taking a pill to them and it's it's it seems to be more accepting accepted by them and it, it increases the use so maybe this will be an easier crossover for people so you know uh, so all of these applications that were accepted up at the state I, i'm estimating at least two-thirds of them are grows hopefully because th that way people won't be disappointed um production facilities are probably be just be a little bit less and and hopefully not everybody's going after dispensaries because you know if they're all dispensary heavy and cultivation light we're not going to have anywhere to sell it and a, a bunch of people are going to be disappointed at the at the state level well, um, and also if, if you do the math and you think that okay five six hundred applications sounds like a lot but in reality they're handing out 66 licenses for dispensaries in the state of 66 Nevada. now they're going to need three to four grows for each of those dispensaries and and also three to four manufacturing places so you're talking almost 200 grows and almost 200 manufacturing so that's 466 licenses plus the testing being handed almost 470 licenses that should be handed out so hopefully this not will be, be like a lot Oprah. of disappointed people everybody gets a license everybody gets approved <laughs> i wish so but we're not that lucky but you also got to remember the applicants they had to turn in two separate packages to the state one with the personal identifying information for financial background mm -hmm. and one without the personal information that's right that's right yeah you had to turn in four non-identified binders so they could give those to people and it had nothing about your company and those people could score it by the the, the rating system that's set up for the the merit-based rating system and have no idea who they're scoring so they keep it honest I wonder if Chad and the people that are going to be reviewing these are going to be the cone heads, like our <laughs> county commissioners, or if they're actually, you know, going to communicate because they're not identifying markers in there. They, they are. They're called non. They're non-identified um, people, non-identified companies, stuff like this. And these are non-identified binders, and it basically reads: dispensary is going to do X Y, you know, with X Y Z company, and they're going to deliver the product in you know such a manner. Um, and and so none of it's identified, like you know, like we're going to use DHL to deliver our weed. I mean, like that would ever happen. Yeah, but you, not, had to out, you had to outlay your security plans, your order control control plans, your inventory control plans, but without giving any indication of who you were or anything like that so that the scoring could be 
fair and there was nobody said, hey, I know these guys. I'm going to give them a few extra points. All right, you guys, uh, let's move on for more local news. Uh, on Thursday at 9 a.m., the Advisory Commission on the Administration of Justice Subcommittee for the Medical Use of Marijuana meeting is on Thursday at 9 a.m. It looks like it's going to be a packed house with as many people as, say, as saying that they're going to attend. And there are a lot of different things that are on the agenda. We have people here that um, that are using a hands-off cash system, and they're and they're um, and they're delivering, I guess, a, ma a, a machine to your company, like an ATM, where people put money into this machine. They get a little receipt, and then they take the receipt over to the bud tender and hand it to the bud tender in exchange for the cannabis. So nobody is touching money in your store except, except for the for consumer. The consumer. Mm -hmm. And I, Kurt just went and heard about this company uh, at a meeting today. Mm -hmm. It yeah, was, they'll uh, be presenting on Thursday, and it's a hands-off to the cash approach, so none of your employees touch it, and all of your all of your transactions are recorded. So when the money goes to the bank, there's nothing, nothing, there's no money laundering, no backdoor deals. Everything is totally recorded, which should keep the bank safe, the dispensary safe, and everyone safe. Now, did they talk about a percentage of how much money that uh, that it would cost? Is it similar to like an ATM transaction fee where exactly. it's like 2% or the, is it just a flat fee? They or? provide you with the kiosk. They provide you with the, the hardware and the software and everything like that. And they charge a 1.75% fee for every dollar that goes through there. Huh. Well, I guess that's not too bad. I mean... What do you think, Raymond? Raymond's looking like grumpy. OGB is what he's looking I, like. I'm, I'm pondering it. I'm, okay. I'm working out the whole situation in my head because we've heard different stories about uh, businesses being penalized for not filing with the IRS, the IRS not taking their money, banks not taking money. I mean, so it's a lot to process you know i would i think i would have to see or hear the presentation personally to get some more facts because i'm just having a boatload of questions pop up in my head right now well you know what you can put those questions down on paper and come thursday morning at 9 a.m because these people that presented today are also going to present for uh this advisory committee on thursday so you can you can save your questions or write them down or or, or whatever and just show up at 9 a.m uh on thursday and the at the, uh, the Grant Sawyer, Grant Sawyer building. It's, it's at the Grant Sawyer building. Uh, it's right off of Las Vegas Boulevard near Washington. Five 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 East Washington. Five 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 East Washington at the Grant Sawyer building. And you know it's really not that difficult to get to. I didn't know the first time. I actually rode my wheelchair from the BTC in downtown to that building. It was uh -huh. about a nice half hour, forty five minute roll. But then come to find out there's a bus that goes right past there. So if, if you're needing transportation or you're not able to get around, just get to the BTC in a timely fashion, you know, and jump on the 113. It'll drop you right off in front of the Grand Sawyer building. And if you'd like to attend and you have problems getting there, it is also uh, video conferenced online. So I'll post the link later this evening on our Facebook page and uh, you can go right online and watch it from the comfort of your home if you like. And yeah, so you can take bong rips and watch us. And you can also email in your comments and questions to the chair, uh, State Tick Senator Siegerbloom. Tick Siegerbloom. Yes, it is. Uh, the chair is uh, Senator Tick Siegerbloom um, for this meeting. And this me meeting happens again on Thursday morning at 9 a.m. at the Grant Sawyer Building. So everybody plan on attending. The next thing that we have, um, Raymond, you and I were discussing this off the air this, we we have a job fair on Monday at 4 p.m. We have Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. You're missing all between Monday. I know that. But so, oh, we you're can go back and Friday. Around? Okay. Okay. <laughs> but, no, but uh, the reason I want to talk about this is because City Council has a meeting at 3 p.m. on Monday in which you're going to discuss this scoring system 
of for of, the city for the city for applications. It's a joint meeting, <laughs> not not a, not a meeting where you can bring your cannabis cigarettes, but a joint meeting between the planning commission mm -hmm. and the full city council. You know what? Every time we can holds a meeting, the city holds a meeting too, like coffee with the mayor yeah, and stuff like this that. This Thursday, the that same as our advisory meeting. Th Thursday, th there's a coffee with the mayor at the same time as the medical marijuana advisory meeting. Do you think that the city somehow uh, doesn't want us there? Divide and conquer is how you win the hearts and minds. You divide the strong people, then you conquer the weaker people. Really, but you know, hey, I, there's I, not I, a lot of. I mean, there's not a lot of really weak people in, in cannabis advocacy. But but the bureaucrats don't look at us like that. They look at us like a bunch of stoners. Huh. <laughs> well, I wonder what that was. I think that that was our offline ghost. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, hey, I, I, I would invite our dear mayor to any one of our events. Mayor Goodman, if you're out there, I invite you to our events. Moreover, I invite you to join us on air and please tell us what is your, um, why are you against the medical marijuana thing if one of your own family members uses it as medication? That is my million dollar question. And if you don't want to do it, if you don't want to come on and speak about this live, we'll be more than happy to take you to lunch and speak with you one on one. For sure, for sure. But um, we have a job fair on Monday at 4 p.m. at the Clark County Public Library, and that's on Flamingo near Maryland Parkway. It's a free event, and the cost of, of getting in is basically just to fill out an application on what your strengths are. Um, and it, this is not only a cannabis application, this is just a regular application because we'll, we'll be needing people for administration of, uh, uh, of different um, programs. We will need people to read data entry. Graphic we need designers. People, graphic That's designers. Awesome. The delivery. ancillary businesses will need employees. So, I mean, this is going to be a huge, huge thing. That's right. So, please, you know, when you come, make sure you have your resume updated. Make sure any cannabis experience you may have. Even if you've been a caregiver or you're a medical marijuana patient and you've been growing for X amount of years or you have experience with this strain when someone else can't get to work you want to highlight your strengths that way when we get to the dispensaries open up and the cultivations and whatnot we can make sure we have the strongest employees there so the patients and the entire community went out for sure and the address there is 1401 east flamingo road and the uh, uh, the date is august 25th at 4 p.m so that's monday yeah monday from four to eight Okay, so what was going on on Friday? Wasn't there something on Friday? No, Saturday we have no, our Saturday. Saturday where the weekend is having their very first patients first meeting in Pahrump. We're starting a new chapter in Pahrump. So all you listeners out there in Nye County, if you want to get involved and become part of this, uh, check our Facebook page or our, or our website www.wecan702.org, and uh, come on out. And you know, you know we're we're trying to start up something new out there and get a new patients program out there in Pahrump to help the people of Nye. Yep, and that's at the Town Diner on Highway 372 in Pahrump, Nevada, 89048 is the address. And come and join us at 2 p.m. All right, we're going into a break, and when we come out of the break, we'll talk about the Prince of Pot, we'll talk about why Florida is so uptight, and other regional news. Do you need help getting your Nevada medical marijuana card? Dr. Reefer is now accepting new patients. There are no medical records required. We have a doctor on staff to give you a thorough physical examination. There is a 99% approval rate for patients. They also have a money back guarantee. If you don't qualify, you don't pay. Free consultation is available. Call 702-428-0000. 702-428-0000. To get your Nevada Medical Marijuana card today. Locally owned and operated TSI, Total Safety Incorporated. 
has kept our community safe since 1998. We provide superior services offering professional installation, local fire and burglar alarm monitoring, and the fastest response times in Las Vegas. We also offer armed and unarmed security, video security systems, access control, and fire safety installation and service. All of your security needs are covered. Call us at 702-967-0000. That's 702-967-0000. Or visit us at tsivegas.com. Las Vegas Hymnfest is here, October 4th, with live performances from... Burn yeah, welcome to the wax room. Baby back. Yeah, on the Cypress Hill send off. Dub C. Marlon Asher. Call me the Ganja Farmer. New Kingston. <laughs> and a surprise performance from the LBC. In the 50 bands, DJs, speakers, and comics. All at the Las Vegas Hemp Fest, October 4th. Get your tickets now at all diversity tattoo and smoke shop locations. And at LasVegasHempFest.com. That's LasVegasHempFest.com. Brought to you by Dr. Reefer. Welcome back, everybody. This is the We Can Nevada's Cannabis News. Our 420 moment today is for the Prince of Pot. The Prince of Pot has returned. Mark Emery is out of jail in, in the States, and he's heading back home to Canada. He's already home. He's already home in That's Canada, right. and he's smoking his first joint in public. I saw the other day. Woo, woo, woo. Hey, Perry broke that news last week. Well, I, you know, I know he broke that news back, but he's right out. Right here on and our And he's shows. home. Yeah, he's, he's out. On he's Canadian home. soil again. And he's on Canadian soil again. Um, Mark Emery got in trouble for shipping marijuana seeds across the border to the United States. He was selling seeds. And that's the reason he got in trouble. Which but, is legal in Canada. Which is legal in Canada, mm -hmm. but he got extradited. Yeah, we went over there. We went to Canada and pulled him into America and threw him in federal prison for doing something that was 100% legal in the country he lived in. Yeah, he, he's expected to resume his activism for cannabis policy reform and, and is going to support his wife Jody's political campaign to run for the Liberals in Vancouver East. He's also embarking on a speaking tour that includes visits to Spain and Ireland. He has spent the last five years in prison. He, this is a failed drug war. We need to get, not only does, you know, is, is he home, but we need to bring people home that have been imprisoned here from Northern California, like Eddie Lepp. Eddie Lepp is in a supermax prison in Colorado for um, cannabis and for, and for basically just having a um, nonprofit type of type of cooperative up in Clear Lake, California. Um, all of our failed drug war prisoners need to be returned to their homes because this is a nonviolent crime. And so our 420 moment goes to Mark Emery, the Prince of Pot. We salute you. We had uh, one more bit of local news coming up. Uh, we can on uh, this Sunday is hosting our our monthly potluck and pool party. So uh, these these parties are designed to build community and bring people together and have fun. So if you're not doing anything on Sunday, look it up on our website. It's going to be a whole lot of fun. If you're a patient, it is on private property. So you know. We, you are allowed to you medicate. Are allowed to medicate. And have those delicious cookies that you need to keep away from Jen. <laughs> yes. 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 Spe well, speaking of edibles and cookies, guess what Florida says? Florida says Florida's anti weed group calls edibles the new face of date rape. Say what? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I wish that ever happened to me on a date. <laughs> here, here, have this brownie. <laughs> Yeah, uh, it doesn't. Uh, I've, you're, you're, I've had a lot joking. of animals. No, I'm not joking. After legalizing CBD this year, Florida is uh, voting to amend um, 
their their amendment to this fall that would both legalize broader forms of medical marijuana and make it far easier to access um, the marijuana for patients in need in Florida. But there's a big pushback saying that uh, the, a billionaire donated $2.5 million to Florida's anti-legalization campaign, uh, aptly t- entitled Vote No on Two. Well, that's original. Um <laughs> And now the delusion begins. Vote no on two it basically says that it's immoral and they're calling edibles the new face of date rape. Um, they're driving off the industry's one Achilles heel that that edibles are a stronger product. Now, I've seen people that fall asleep on edibles. I have seen people that vomit on off of edibles, but the next day they remember things that happen. Not only that, I don't think that I've ever really given an edible to somebody and been like, come here, baby. And they're like, oh, I don't even know what's going on. And the I, key, key word is fall asleep there. It's not knock you out to where if somebody shakes you or moves you around, you're or takes completely off your clothes. out of it. Exactly. You're just, you might fall asleep like normal. You know, it's not it's not a date rape. And and mind you, this also the average edible takes about forty five minutes to an hour to take effect. So yeah, it's exactly. not like slipping a roofie at <laughs> somebody's drink yeah. and taking them out back ten minutes later. No, you gotta sit there and talk to them for at least an hour. And then and then they might fall asleep in the right conditions. If they're if they're in a social situation, they're not gonna fall asleep. The worst thing I've ever <laughs> seen anything happen to anybody is them vomit. Um, from edibles and, and you know and some people that aren't or get hungry and eat more and and that is a danger that is a danger if you eat one pot brownie and you have a whole pan of pot brownies around you need to switch on to something else like potato chips or non-pot brownies or you can get sick and, and that's it, right because it does take a while for it to hit so and this is where self-control comes in and it also <laughs> is where the labeling comes in if you're a patient and you know how much that you yourself can consume to fix your ailment, to make you comfortable, make you feel good, you're not going to overdo it. Well, at least I'm not and get to a situation where you can't function. Yet at the same time, there are people that get fall down drunk, urinate and vomit all over themselves and they don't even remember what happened five hours later, let alone the next day. Well, if I did all that, I don't know if I would want to be remembering it either. I mean, like, uh, you know what? I, I hope that is a race from my mind and everybody's that encountered me. Um, but you know what? I find this story offensive. Offensive in the way that um, that there are people that have that are given roofies and they're raped and and it's a horrible experience to see that you're, if you take a marijuana brownie that you're going to be raped um, is not only offensive it's just plain wrong. A, a sexual assault occurs every two minutes in the United States for these victims, their families, and their friends. Comparing a life-altering experience to an infused cannabis product. Um, just represents a giant slap in the face, you know, and it also is, it's part of that, just that whole mentality of, of fear and still fear madness. in people. Yeah. Reefer madness and still a fear in people and they will be controlled. It's just offensive to me. Well, I'd like to personally find that billionaire and slap him upside the head, but thankfully I think it was the Koch brothers, wasn't it? It would the not even, it wouldn't even surprise me. Oh, okay. But thankfully over in Washington State after legalization, Hemp Fest more celebration. Seattle's very own Protestival is back without much protest. Hemp- oh, yeah. You know, for uh, those hippies, Hemp Fest 2014 has the usual tie dyed t shirt, dreadhead, high minded attendees, but mar- with marijuana now legal in, in Washington. The tone of the 23-year-old festival has shifted from dissent to celebration. Well, I got to tell you this. This is great, great news and everything else. But I, I was talking to people that were attending Seattle's Hemp Fest. They said it was horrendous to get into there because there are so many people trying to get in. Their lines were bigger than Burning Man lines. And I said, really? And they said, yeah, 900,000 people and there are two to three roads into the place. Now imagine the cluster cluck on that one. 
um, that not only that, that it was really humid and all of this other stuff. And I said, but wait, you're in Hip Fest. Everybody was smoking. Oh, yeah, yeah. There's that after the five hour wait to get in. I'm like, oh, God, we'll come to our Hemp Fest on October 4th because I don't think that we're expecting 900,000. I mean, it would be nice. But I don't think we're expecting for the first Hemp Fest 900,000 people. I don't think the county would be prepared for nearly half of that. <laughs> yeah, I hope, I actually hope 900,000 don't show up so we can hold it again next year. <laughs> so, Maybe 10,000. 10,000 would be a good number. 10,000 is a good number. 10,000 is a great number. Did you talk about our pool party? Yes, we brought up the pool party. Uh, yeah, where were you? Over there eating brownie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Exactly. You Come know where I was. <laughs> well, while why you ponder which direction you want to go. Okay. Uh, Colorado's marijuana sales hit a record $24.7 million in June. This represents a 19% increase from May, from the May to June numbers. And it can be attributed to the opening of more recreational cannabis stores around the state. Well, you know, I, I've got to say on that one that a lot of people that are medical cannabis patients in Colorado are still using private services and they are still growing their own uh, to a large extent. I've talked to uh, a bunch of people that have been in Colorado for a while and the dispensaries while initially they were used, um, they were used, they're used more by people that don't have access to the cannabis, like the elder population, people that just move there, et cetera. But a lot of people are not only growing their own, but they're, they're using local like delivery services. Well, and also on that note, uh, in Colorado, there are a lot of private cannabis clubs that have been opening up to where you become a member and you can come to this private club where only members can come in and, and, Mind you, this is a recreational state, and you can use your cannabis there. Um, and right now, the, the Colorado police are raiding these private clubs. Uh, Why are they raiding them? Well, uh, marijuana-centric events, even the private ones, remain a uh, continuous and hot-button issue throughout Colorado. Just a month after Denver police raided Mary Jane's social club, Wheat Ridge's police, just northeast of Denver, performed a similar operation on August 4th, uh, a Denver News 7 headline read, Wheat Ridge, head shop owners plead not guilty to operating illegal marijuana club. Withdrew the plea. The story explained that the owners of the Three Kings Dab Supply, a head shop at 44th and Ward, were cited for operating an illegal marijuana club. So, so was this an illegal club or was it, or was it just something that, that they approved? How is it illegal? It's a recreational state. They're, it's a recreational state, but you, each business that you own, the business, ha the zoning and licensing has something to do with it. Just a little bit, right? A great example. I can't, I can't now, under Las Vegas law, go into a liquor store on Fremont Street and open up a bottle under the canopy. I can't. That's but, right. But I get off Fremont Street. I'm not on that strip area. I could have a little more luck doing that. So maybe the situation is, have they approved these kind of social clubs under their law? Well, the law says that you can use in private. And if it's a private club and you have to be a member to get in, is that not private? Well, I mean, that's the reason the Elks Club people can smoke their cigarettes at the bar and eat their lunch. Because it, Elks Club is not a bar. It's a the Elk, private club. The Elks Club is a private club, and you can smoke your cigarettes and eat your lunch at the Elks Club because the normal bar rules don't apply to the Elks Club. It's a private, members-only club. Well, we're certainly going to have to keep our eye on the story because this may end up setting the precedent nationally. Well, you know, the thing is, is that a couple of our members have, have specifically asked me about um, bringing up to the advisory board this Thursday, you know, these businesses at Thursday at 9 a.m. at 655, you know, East Washington. 555 East Washington. <laughs> Where oh, five, five, you go? I, I was going to the animal shelter. God, you guys. <laughs> anyway, so they've asked me specifically about these private clubs. Oh, it, can we open these private clubs here in Nevada? Can we open these private clubs here in Las Vegas? Can we have these ancillary businesses? And I said, this is a one of the questions that you really should bring up to the advisory board because in getting business licensing for these clubs, we would have to get approval from the municipalities, correct? 
I, w- I would think so. Um, what kind of approval does the Elk Club need to get? You know, that's a great point, Raymond. We're going to open the Weekend Club. Well, yeah, the Elks Club is a nonprofit, so and that's a true. private club. So, I mean, maybe that's a way around the laws. There well, it's not go. a way around the law. It's a way of working, working with within. the law. Yeah, working within the law, sorry. <laughs> so, other news out of Colorado. Uh, Denver's haters are complaining about the smell of marijuana. <laughs> This people re- got people don't like weed in, in Denver. <laughs> well, no, it's it, this was reported on August 14th. Approximately 30 percent of the smell complaints that have been filed since January 1st have been related to industrial grows in and around Denver. Uh, the flush scent hasn't violated any of Denver's regulatory regulatory codes, but it has caused some citizens to complain, which in turn has opened the door for one prohibitionist at breachbart.com to spin the issue into a serious problem <laughs> so so haters gonna hate yeah and then and, and from uh it's just the flower they told the usa today they're afraid of the smell but right up the street we have a dog food factory and speaking <laughs> from experience that dog food factory purina provides the most nauseating scent in denver and is conveniently located next to the airport not only is it next to the airport it's right next to the freeway and i went by and i was we were driving by there and i'm like what's that smell i smelled that before because i used to work at the animal shelter i'm like i've smelled that before and I look up, and there's Purina. It's this huge dog food f- cooking factory, and they're cooking the dog food, and it smells like cooked dog food. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so well, that's offensive to me. Well, we have the ramen sauce packet place up by uh, Nellis, don't we? Isn't that where they make the little packets that go into ramen noodles? Because you can smell that certain times. Really? Yeah, things you don't know. Things you don't know. Um, Well, in California, and more news in California, um, the historic medical marijuana bill is dead. And the cause of of death is cost polarization. Um, Law enforcement has waged a war on medical marijuana since 1970, and they're losing that, that that war. The... There are 27 months from legalization vote in California, and about 53% of the voters support the 21 and over legalization um, act with restrictions. They want to have adult use before they have regulated medical marijuana use, um, says Steve D'Angelo. And that's not what's wanted. They want to fix the medical marijuana laws before they bring um, the before they bring uh, legal medical use or non-medical use to California. So basically it looks like it died because it died because not everybody could agree on, on, you know, the medical marijuana bill. Well, it seems like lobbyists were saying that $20 million was too high for the new California Bureau of Medical Marijuana, especially given just how few businesses would qualify and actually pay the fees to run the agencies. Huh. You know. So you know the, the the old divide and conquer thing, Raymond. I think that goes along here. We have a, a an adult legal use um, bill going around here, or adult responsible, responsible adult use, use, responsible adult use going around here in Nevada, and a lot of people bicker over the small things, and it divides the community. Instead of everybody just saying, "Okay, this is either a, this is a great bill, let's just go forward with it," you have people that are either haters or they go, "Oh, I don't want to pass this if if we can't pass it the way I want to," and I've heard people say exactly that, and then. The people that are smoking pot are the haters on the bill that for re- responsible adult use. And I've actually seen people and heard people say that. It's like they can't stand behind the bill, so they, they'd rather just divide the community. What them there are are hypocrites. Oh, that's what they call it? Hypocrites? Hypocrites. <laughs> uh, other California news. California's historic drought is threatening the marijuana industry. With nearly 60% of California now experienced quote-unquote exceptional drought, the worst level ever recorded in the state, the threat of water shortages loomed over the state's agriculture industry. Among those already feeling the pain are the medical marijuana growers. 
A lot, are, are a lot of those the indoor grows or the hydroponic grows or are, are they talking even outdoor grows on that it, one? It, it doesn't really say. All it says uh, you have uh, one grower in Mendocino County who says his plants require anywhere between 5 to 10 gallons of water per day. But while many farmers have taken steps to conserve water and grow the crops in an, envir in an environmentally friendly way, state officials say that it that illegal grows in areas like Lake County could be making the drought even worse by tapping into water sources illegally and leaving damaging chemicals in the soil. So it looks like what it is is the illegal grows is what's consuming a lot of the waters and it's making all the medical marijuana growers look bad. Well, wow. wow. Wow, speaking of growers. <laughs> yeah, speaking of growers, before we go to commercial break, I want to give a shout out to our newest sponsor, Green Spot Hydroponics. They're located at 3355 West Lake Mead up there behind the Texas station. Um, Green, Green Spot Hydroponics is a Las Vegas based distributor of specialty indoor and outdoor gardening supplies. Um, they just signed on as a, a new sponsor of We Can, and uh, all you got to do is when you go into there, let them know that you're part of We Can, and they will give you a 10% discount. So thank you, Green Spot Hydroponics. And now let's go to break. When we come back to break, we'll talk about Florida. We'll talk about Jeb Bush. I don't know why. And uh, we'll talk about Pat Robertson. The Vaughn Dank Group offers turnkey solutions for all your cannabis needs, bringing transparency and responsibility to a young budding industry. Helping patients by producing the cleanest, safest, and most potent medicines and infusibles possible. The Von Dank Group is a design, management, and consulting corporation with over 30 years of industry experience and knowledge of the dispensary, edibles, infusible kitchen, and large-scale cultivation of cannabis manufacturing facilities. Let the Von Dank Group help you grow your cannabis business from seed to green. www.vondank.com Finally, Nevada medical marijuana dispensaries are opening, but you must have your medical marijuana card to get inside. Call the friendly team at Karma Holistic Health Foundation, toll free, 855-420-1110, or visit GetMedicalMarijuanaNow.com. Karma Holistic Health Foundation will give you legal access to medical marijuana. All veterans receive a discount, 855-420-1110, or visit GetMedicalMarijuanaNow.com. You're listening to the Nevada Cannabis News Hour, produced by We Can, the wellness education cannabis advocates of Nevada. We Can is a 501c3 nonprofit. If you're interested in sponsoring us, donating, or advertising on this radio show, please contact our advertising department at 702 218 5226 or Kurt, K U R T, at WeCan702.org. Hi, welcome back to the show. This is Weekend 702, Nevada's Cannabis News. If you'd like to call in and ask any questions or have any uh, concerns about any of the stories, give us a call at 702-731-1230 or 866-820-5528. All right, as, as promised, we'll come back to a story. And Kurt, what do you got for us? Well, I got a feel-good story or maybe not so feel-good. But uh, this was uh, by the MPP News on August 15th. Uh, you remember the days when ounces of weed cost a whopping eight dollars in the 1970s never because I, I was uh, you know i was too young to smoke that <laughs> well we've all heard the legends stories of a time when dope was dope and dime bags actually cost a dime yeah that's right that's where they got their name from because that's what they cost uh <laughs> beach how, how when you were young how much was an ounce of weed for you well uh for years we paid eight dollars an ounce and then it went to ten dollars an ounce and when it went to twelve dollars an ounce, we wanted to quit. We wanted to have a protest. Now, now, almost, you know, uh, somebody just told me a, a pack of cigarettes cost twelve bucks in New York City. Yeah, that's crazy. Oh my goodness. Were were, were the roads even paved when they were paying eight dollars an ounce? <laughs> well, you know, well, no, no. This was, these were the prices back before yeah. the drug war. Okay, so here's a here's another. Uh, the, a failed example. failed example of the drug war. It's driven the prices up for the patients. One of the most noticeable differences in the pricing, back in the days of disco, <laughs> Ivy Legos were paying no more than $20 an ounce. 
So students at Brown were paying $8 for Mexican swag, while their peers over at Dartmouth were smoking homegrown bud for no more than $10 an ounce. Harvard was paying $20 an ounce for Vietnamese sativa, while students at Columbia paid $60 an ounce for the prized Colombian red. Weed was cheap, plentiful, and from what we can tell, everybody was using it. <laughs> Oh my so. goodness! That I don't know if that's such a feel-good story because, like, now what? It, what's the average price now for an ounce of weed? Is like what four hundred bucks? Two to four hundred dollars. Yeah. Now back in <laughs> back in that day, the the average the average THC in in the weed was one point seven percent. Well, modern what? yeah, modern strains average about thirteen, and some of your higher grades can get up into the twenty five <laughs> to thirty well, percent. Well, no wonder for eight <laughs> bucks you have to smoke the whole zip. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, oh my good. The, yeah, the chronic of days past is is the swag of the modern era. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So oh yeah, you know what? And then there was the seed weed. I kind of remember that where you yeah. take a whole ounce and you take uh, you take like a, a frisbee, put a, it on a frisbee and shake it sideways. Yeah, and that, put it on the frisbee and shake it sideways. Either that or you take your or you take your the binder of your book that you the, use for school. The trays and, from the fast food places worked really good too. So, oh, so it's not like we hadn't been smoking for a minute or anything, huh? I did not inhale. I did speaking not of, inhale. Speaking of, right quick, happy birthday to former President William Jefferson Clinton. I did not have mm. sex with that woman. <laughs> I did not inhale. Uh, over in Minnesota. The Minnesota legislature enacted a law that created the medical cannabis program. This law established the state's broad policy. To fully develop the details for the program, the legislature authorized the Department of Health to adopt the rules. Oh, that's great. That's great. The Department of Health, is, it should be involved with it. Not, not any, you know, medical, judicial branches or nothing. Right. I mean, medical, that, that's what it is. So the Department of Health has the authority. Uh, they can implement this law quickly, but do so comprehensively. And they also have the authority to use two types of rulemaking procedures. For one for the initial implementation, the department can do expedited rulemaking. And for the longer range administration, the department will use regular formal rulemaking procedures. Wow. Well, at least they're moving on it. Well... A sad day, Pat Robertson, the marijuana legalization movement loses Pat Robertson. No, he's not dead. <laughs> <laughs> well, guess what? Pat Robertson has apparently changed his mind on the subject of legal marijuana just two years after he said that he thinks the United States should treat marijuana that they we the way that they treat the beverage alcohol on the 700 Club. Um, he's backed off on that and said, Little kids are getting high. <laughs> yeah, all they're doing is opening their parents' medicine cabinet and getting the pills in there. Shut they're up, not, Pat. They're not even doing that. Their parents are giving them the Ritalin and everything else. So Exactly. You know, but this is the same guy that back back about 10 years ago said that if we if we legalize gay marriage, the next thing people will be having sex with ducks. So, you know, who really cares? <laughs> who cares what Pat Robinson <laughs> has to say? <laughs> okay, so how many states have legalized uh, same-sex marriage now, and how many states are having issues with bestiality? None that I've heard the news. Have you? Oh, my goodness. No, none that I want to hear. <laughs> All those but duck cluckers out there. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you guys. Uh, in other news, our producer Beach is leaving for Burning Man, and he's going to um, be at Black Rock City, and he is a ranger at Burning Man. What's the Burning Man? Uh, what's the Burning Man jive, Beach? What's going on with that? Well, it's the uh, largest uh, event uh, like it in, in Nevada and in this part of the country. About seventy thousand people will gather for extreme self-expression in art, and uh, it's uh, you know. Very uh, community friendly and eclectic, and uh, I'm a Black Rock City Ranger. I'll be there for two weeks, and uh, I hope to come back with some wonderful pictures and great memories and burn the man. Well, That's awesome. And, you know, Beach was kind of explaining to me what burn the man means, and I've been going to a lot of Burning Man events, and I think I'm going to go next year. But burning the man is symbolic of basically burning what 
inside you that what you don't like, you don't need, or or uh, anything else? Getting speech? rid of the bad. Getting rid of the bad, and also radical self-expression. You also have to be able to take care of yourself because. There is no showers. There are no potable water, running water there. Um, you have to bring all that in. So there mm -hmm. are showers being brought in by people that they share with other people. And there are, you know, is water being brought in, but you need to bring your own water. Well, I'll tell Drinking you, this. Water. it's uh, much more civilized than that. Uh, sure, some people really rough it, but the truth is there's showers and people set up uh, towns and cities. It's, uh, it's absolutely incredible. You can watch it online. So go online and watch uh, welcomehome.org and, uh, and support uh, our community. That's amazing. It's about, what, 350 bucks per ticket? About, about, about in there. And it can go up to a, almost $800 per ticket. Uh, if you're with a theme camp, something, something like that, you may go up early to put some art installations up, stuff like that. But it's not only about self-expression. It's also about um, taking care of yourself. And that's what he, we in the medical marijuana community like to do. We like to be able to take care of ourselves and to, and to supply for ourselves. No? Raymond says no. I'm shaking my head at being a stanky for two weeks. <laughs> I, I, I need my daily so soap and water. Well, you know, they do have da some people do have daily soap and water. There's some people that are do rough it, extreme rough it. Well, um, and there are some people that have told me that they it took them a week to get sand out of the places that they rarely we can't see. Say <laughs> uh, the truth is, uh, the camp I'm in, Contraption, is camp about 50 people. We have NASA scientists and everyone in our camp. We have uh, solar showers. We have oh, all kinds. We have all kinds of stuff. I'm telling you, uh, uh, Circus Soleil is there. The Department of Defense. Every every government agency on the planet is there. It's absolutely incredible. Uh, wow. If you're hiding from the feds, I don't think I would go there. <laughs> well, I think that they go there to hide from themselves sometimes, you know. All right, you guys, back to Florida. We, Jesus, why are there a lot of things in, going on in Florida? Share your Jeb Bush story. You didn't my know, Jeb, my Jeb You didn't Bush. know why you were going to do the Jeb Bush. So. Oh, Jeb Bush opposes Florida Mar Medical Marijuana Initiative. Former Florida Governor Jeb Bush, Republican, is urging Floridians to vote against the medical marijuana ballot measure, according to a statement he published uh, Thursday in the Tampa Bay Times. Florida leaders and citizens have worked for years to make the Sunshine State a world-class location to start a business or run a business, a family-friendly destination for tourism, and a desirable place to raise a family or retire, said the prospective uh, 2016 GOP presidential candidate. Um, so Jeb Bush is basically saying that al allowing large-scale marijuana operations to take root across Florida under the guise of using it for medicinal purposes runs counter to all of the efforts that they have put in place to make Florida a family-friendly state. But hold up. Remember, Bush comes from um, the Reagan era, you know, uh, just say no. That's His true. His daddy's. His daddy was uh, vice president to Ronald Reagan, and they did all this stuff in the 80s. So, you know, that's just ingrained to him, unfortunately, because he also did an interview where he said that uh, marijuana should be left up as a state's right. So, apparently, if this man intends to run for president in 2016, people need to realize that this is where he stands on the issue. And this is where he's coming from. So, you know what? Don't vote for him. <laughs> yeah, that's not... Personally, I think the last thing we need is a, a third Bush in the White House. <laughs> but I wouldn't mind a Clinton. Connecticut growers. <laughs> oh, did I? You wouldn't buy, you mind a Clinton Bush in the White House? Or uh, a Clinton in the A Clinton. A Clinton. Oh, oh okay. I'm, I'm all for Hillary in 2016 as long as she quits being a dum-dum. But um, <clears throat> Connecticut Growers, to, oh, we're out of time. Well, we got, no, we got one minute. Oh, I got one minute. Connecticut Growers sending marijuana cream, uh, uh, crops. Advanced Grow Labs, one of Connecticut's four medical marijuana companies, slogged through the process of competing for a state license, zoning, and other things. Nearly two years after it legalized, the first medical marijuana is expected to go on sale next month. 
two years? That's a long time. So we'll follow up with this. Uh, Less time than it took us. Yeah, we'll follow up with this and uh, talk about it next time. Next All right, time. you guys, remember that we got the pool party on Sunday coming up, and that's on Casanova. You can find the address on our website, www.wecan702.org. You can also find it on our way, our Facebook, Weekend 702 uh, on Facebook. And then you have the Legislative Committee on Thursday at 9. All right, you guys, take care of yourself and be safe out there.